Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Public Allies. I'm your host for today's roundtable. My name is Aisha Sardar, and I am one of the team members of Public Allies. It is wonderful that, you know, every week we come here bringing new topics and new discussions so we can discuss the social issues, not only social issues, we can discuss business, social issues, real estate, whatever you want to discuss. So we at Public Allies have been trying to bring panelists, experts who can talk about these things and give you more information on these topics. Today, one such very important topic is immigrants and the challenges that they face. Immigrants contribute to the economy and create jobs for Canadians. The, you know, Canada's acceptance of immigrants demonstrates compassion and leadership and enhances uh, our global standing. But on the other hand, immigrants also contribute a lot to the Canadian economy. They boost trade ties between Canada and the world. They strengthen culture and diversity and are motivated. They become entrepreneurs and they, they help and provide for the labor force, pay taxes, which help fund our public services. Immigrants also deliver um, and improve the health and social services. Many immigrants arriving in Canada are young and pay for the health system more than what they need as benefits. This lower use, sorry, my headphones are off. This lower use of healthcare system is known as health immigrant effect. Immigrants also integrate fully into Canadian society, they become volunteers, they take part, take active part in social organizations. They always want to give back to the community and they also participate in community activities. And this in turn helps build a stronger community. But uh, there are a lot of challenges that they face and to discuss what immigrants go through, we have today with us a panel which consists of individuals who are not only immigrants, but also who work around immigrants. So welcome with us our panelists for today. Welcome everyone. Welcome. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, so let me introduce you to our panelists um, in alphabetical order. First, we have Azar Khan. Welcome, Azar. Again, on Public Allies. So he is a triple distinguished Toastmaster. He served Toyota globally for around 20 plus years in different countries. He is a certified Kaizen coach, certified Toyota dealership trainer and instructor. Azar speaks different languages, which I'm not going to get into. Otherwise, the bio is never going to be complete. He has bachelor's in business, computer science, as well as master's in economics. He has traveled many countries while working at Toyota, where he learned many methodologies like Toyota production system, Toyota Way, 5S, JIT, and Kaizen. He often says his experience in Japan was life altering. He also believes Toastmasters changed his whole being and gave him direction through which he learned leadership skills that has sent him on the path to where he is today. His greatest pride is in having over a thousand youth graduate from his youth leadership program, Toastmasters and Kaizen Workshop. He also has a catering company called Durham Catering, which was his wife's dream and which proudly serves our communities with great food. Currently, he is a licensed realtor and also a senior business consultant with Deluxe Properties. Again, welcome, Azar. Thank you. Second, we have Parisa Wahabi. Welcome, Parisa. Uh, she's an <laughs> she's an engineer turned finance professional with seven plus years of experience working across the globe. She has a passion for energy, problem solving, and mentoring. A traveler by heart with Bangladeshi roots. She loves to try new things and so moved to Canada to reinvent life in a new country. Dreams to achieve life goals while also helping others realize their ambitions. She volunteers for different nonprofit and she also believes in giving back to the community. That is so wonderful, Parisa. We are so happy. And she's also 
uh, one of the team members of Public Allies, which he joined recently. So thanks for that. Last but not least, we have Susie Tamasi. Am I spelling that right? Am I pronouncing that's, that right? That's correct. <laughs> Thank you. She is an entrepreneur, award-winning mentor, author, charity advocate, designer, well-known fashion stylist, and a leader in advocating for entrepreneurship as a way of creating positive transformation in lives. Susie is a founder of Susie Q Jewels, Frugal Divas, Empowered in Heels, Biz in Fashion Magazine, and Women on Biz, an initiative to radically transform how we support, celebrate, and finance female entrepreneurs. She, she, is, a, she is currently based in Oshawa, Ontario, with two lovely sons, one 11 years and one 23. She has been organizing events for the past 20 years to raise funds for women shelters she's affiliated with. An entrepreneur and women of style from an early age, she understood very early on that if she wanted something, she had to work for it. And it's that knowing that has helped her break through barriers and tenaciously pursue her love for fashion. She has her own mini empire with a clothing line under Suzy Q Jewels. She's a well-known fashion stylist who dresses A-listers and loves to dress women to build their confidence. She believes one should never give up on dreams because the universe works towards you and your goals once you are open to the light of kindness and you can accomplish anything you put your mind into. Welcome, Susie. Thank you for having me. Oh my God, those are some long bios. I have to tell you <laughs> that takes a long amount of time, but we are so happy that all of you could make time and join us today. So thanks for that. So without further ado, let's get into our first question, which is how has your experience as an immigrant been and what are the challenges that you have faced in your everyday life? Azar, you want to start? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> First of all, thank you, Aisha, and thank you, Public Allies. Uh, I've been a proud member of a Public license long time, and they always bring the very valid topics. Uh, being a member of Newcomer Advisory Table of Durham uh, and one of my role with the team to, to see what are the scopes, what are the challenges, newcomer coming. I think my experience, if I, what I learn, uh, that you have to do your homework before you are migrating. It's a very emotional and very tough uh, decision for anyone, like uh, not only coming here with family, leaving family, friends. Uh, I feel that it was a little bit challenging uh, when I migrate here, uh, the market was tough. Uh, even though you have to go with credentials. And it took me almost a year to join again Toyota Canada. Uh, and when you go inside the organization, what experience you have, it almost the same, the procedures, but due to the soft skill, and when you arrive here, to, that other people believe in you, that what he's saying is right or wrong, you have to have all the credentials, all your certifications, all your experience should be written, should be certified, you have to bring when you come here. And sometimes you have to upgrade your language or upgrade your soft skill and upgrade. Uh, two things are very important, what I learn and I'm very proud of. Uh, and I'm always uh, opening the doors for the newcomers in my catering company. One of the thing is volunteer, uh, go to the community, serve others. By that way, you learn the culture, the people. Not only it's a good thing that you are serving the community, but you learn also. Like you touch someone's heart and he give you some advice. And th the second thing, if you're not getting a job, what I did, I done the internship. And they said, wow, you have that much of experience. Although it's not good paid, but when, and it's opened many doors because a lot of time opportunities is not coming on your hand. It's moving like this. You have to catch it. So internship, volunteer, and in volunteership, you met great people uh, and, and then you build your rapport. So uh, that some things I done, that was my experience and it worked very well. I'm thankful uh, wherever I am. It's not only my efforts. I'm so thankful 
in last 15 years, whoever come as a Toastmaster uh, in public allies, in connecting GTA, uh, many people make you what you are today. It's not only you. First of all, the blessing of God, but there are many people who helps you to reach you this place. So select the positive people, select the right people on your path when you newly come. You need people, you need friends, you need someone to struggle with you. And I'm so blessed, uh, except Wahhabi, I think, Susie, last five, six, seven years working with me. Um, Aisha is working with me. And that is, I think, it is an asset. Uh, so that is my experience, and I, I love to share with you on that platform. Back to Aisha. Thank you, Adar. That is wonderful. Like, you know, you not only spoke about the challenges, but you spoke like, you know, how to how to overcome them also a little bit. You touched upon them, that which is amazing. Uh, Parisa, you want to go next? What are your challenges that uh, yes, you have faced? Sir. <laughs> So um, actually, I haven't moved here that long ago. So my journey is still ongoing. So I can tell you, uh, speak to people who are also going through the same journey as me. Um, definitely before moving here, I knew that this is not going to be easy. And I would like to tell the same to everybody that be prepared for the worst. But, you know, never give up. Hope for the best at all times. And um, so... For me, some of the challenges I would speak to is, of course, uh, I'm sure that everybody faces is finding a job, of course. But I think um, what I want to tell everyone is to keep an open mind, you know. And yes, uh, it is unfortunate, maybe to some extent, that um, whatever experience you have had internationally may not be valued just as much. But, you know, you can do things, you can get as I also mentioned, you know, you can work on certifications or you can work on networking. Uh, one of the things that's really important in Canada is networking to be able to get into the workforce. And so, you know, you can reach out to people. And I'm, what I like about the people here is they understand that they understand that people will be approaching them. So you can take advantage of it and try to reach out to them. And also, uh, like I mentioned, um, don't lose hope. Everything has a way of working itself out. Um, it may not be the same way that it works for everyone else. So um, yes, when you compare to other people's journey, sometimes you, may, you might feel sad, but it's okay. Everybody has their own journey. That's something I feel has been helpful to me um, to deal with my situation that my journey will not be the same as of anybody else's. Um, and also the other thing is, of course, um, well, for me, because I did live in many different countries, so it was not that big of a culture shock. It might happen to a lot of people's life is quite different coming from a South Asian country. I can say that it is quite different you know you just have to take things as it comes to you and not compare um of course you will miss your home which is good you should never forget your roots but you know it's a different country and um there will always be positives and negatives of everything but i would suggest what helps is to look at the bright side of things and it really helps you to go through the journey so yeah Thanks, Parisa. Uh, that was a new immigrant's perspective, which is really nice. So now let's hear from Susie. Susie, you have been working around immigrants and you help them. So tell us, what are the challenges that they face? What have you come across and what are they? Well, I'd like to first give you an example of myself. Um, I am Canadian. And I did go to Venezuela and live there for five years. So I had the experience of coming back to a country after going to school there and having to upgrade myself because the equivalency is not um, looked on as equivalent, even though I find the education in another country is way more um, intense than here because of the technology part. Like, in Venezuela, we could not use calculators. It was all mental math. Here, they allow the calculators, they allow the computers. But my, what I've experienced is that a lot of people that come here 
have a lot of opportunity that they don't take. And it's not a, a sense of their knowledge. It's, it's a sense of that control that they're looked on as a woman, as a second level of not growing or not reaching for the stars or, or, or developing their skills. There's lots of education through the government that are free to access. So you can enhance your, your um, verbal skills. You can enhance your written skills. You can take courses to upgrade your skills. And it's not that Canada doesn't look as it as equivalent. I think they look at the technology because we're so technology based and they think that other countries are not equivalent to it. So it's a good idea to do the volunteer or the mentorship or the internship just to prove that you have those skills so that you can get on to the workforce. So my thing is that I've come across with my company because we help a lot of women from other countries to get out of abusive relationship is that they should develop their skills. They should take that opportunity to even start their own business. There is nothing that can stop you from growing. It's yourself that can actually move yourself forward. Like they're take advantage of BACD. BACD is an amazing location here in Durham that gives free courses or free workshops that you can go online or there right now with COVID. I don't know if they're opening up again, but those are things that you can adapt your skills and they're free. So take that one or two hours to learn something for yourself so you can develop yourself and improve yourself every day. Oh, amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I come across a lot of immigrants as well. I have a lot of them on my caseload. And many of the things like, you know, you guys touched upon, those are the things that they think of. Those are the challenges that they face. Along with that, I would say cultural shock that they face, right? So um, they, they come here. It is a different country from what they've lived in. So there is a cultural shock that happens and adapting to this culture takes some time. So I, I would say take that time um, and enjoy the experience of a new country. Again, housing, that is another uh, thing that new immigrants face. Like uh, you don't have your bank accounts, you can't show that you've worked, sometimes you have not even gotten your job and you need housing. So what do you do at that time? You need, you need somebody signing on behalf of you or, you know, you need a co-signer. Now that is also out of the picture is what I hear. You cannot have a co-signer. You need to show your own records. So there are certain challenges which happen, like, you know, housing, cultural shock, then, you know, you are looking for a job you need to put food on the table there are refugees who don't know the languages so uh, I come across a lot of immigrants who go through all these challenges and it's very surprising uh, in spite of all that they overcome and they make a living here so uh, yes there are solutions which we'll be talking more about so let's get into our second important question so like all of you said the most important thing is employment, right? If you have, if you're employed, if you can bring in that money and put food on the table, the other things can become a lot more easier for the immigrants. But Canadian experience is a term uh, that is used a lot, like soft skills, communication skills, Canadian work, workplace culture. These are like frequently used and without being clearly defined. So sometimes when you're in um, interview, they ask you, do you have Canadian experience? What does that mean? They are new immigrants. How do they have that Canadian experience, right? So while frequently seen as necessary for obtaining an employment, um, it might not always reflect the, uh, the complete picture. And what, what, what do you think, how can they achieve this Canadian experience or how can they explain, what, what, according to you, is the Canadian experience? Um, Parisa, you want to go first this time? Uh, yes, sure. Um, yes, so um, 
something I think everyone has to face, especially when they try to enter the workforce. Um, even though you might have had years of experience uh, working in the field that you are trying to get into here as well, they would say, um, we don't have Canadian experience, right? Um, I think there are two sides of it. One is, of course, the um, technical side of it, that is knowing the job. And, but more than that, I think, uh, is the soft skill side. Um, so it's about integrating into the Canadian way. Um, so all the interviews that I have had, they were more about uh, getting along with the person, the hiring manager, uh, from what I have seen or from what I have talked to a lot of people here. That's the same thing that I have come to know. That what they want to know is there is work, of course, you might get certifications, you might get a degree and show that yes, you can, uh, you are very much capable of doing the work. But what about as a person? Do you match up with the culture of the company? Are you, are you gonna be comfortable with your coworkers? Are you gonna assimilate in the culture of the company? So this is something that they look into. And I understand, um, someone who comes from a different country, of course, it takes time, right? So which is why um, it is a very good idea to get into internships or volunteer work or any other part-time work even, just to integrate, just to talk to people, have that integration process started. And once they see, even if it's not a relevant experience, but they see that you are actually putting in the work to get integrated into the culture, to try to learn the culture of, in Canada. I think they really appreciate it. And that really comes as a positive side. So I would suggest to everyone that um, even if you are not able to right away get a job that you are looking for, get into get you to work in any kind of work, be it volunteer, be it a part-time work. This is a way to this is just a way to show people that um, you are here, you are ready to put in the work to be assimilated in this society, and they would definitely appreciate it. That's how I have come to see it. Okay, that's like, that's, that's really nice. Susie, what do you say? What is Canadian experience? Well, Canadian experience to me is um, adapting adapting to our evolving environment. Um, our cultural employment has changed so much. We're working from home and mm -hmm. developing ourselves daily with uh, courses and betterment of ourselves so that we can be team players and learn how to be able to communicate with other people. I also think networking is a key component in meeting people and developing those skills. <laughs> and developing those skills so that you can improve yourself um, because you never know right now um, to get a job you're submitting uh, sorry my dog it figures no, I, I would I would like to say we have a fourth panelist who wants his voice to be heard what's his name his or her <laughs> um, it's Max it's a he okay <laughs> he's my guard dog so um <laughs> So basically, I, I find right now, because um, resumes are done online, sometimes getting that connection and knowing how to speak to people, they pick up on your opportunities. And that's where they can guide you to get uh, that experience. So either by volunteering, internship, or them recommending you to employers so that you connect with them so that you can get on the workforce. And sometimes you have to start from the beginning. Um, a lot of people here come as, you know, doctorates and senior levels, but sometimes you just need to get in the door and then from there work yourself up. Okay, well, that's nice to know. Uh, Azar, what do you have to say and what has your experience been? Uh, I have a lot of experience. I serve. Uh... Toyota Canada, I serve uh, early days Rogers because that time the market was not good for automotive. I served uh, Bombardier, uh, I served uh, Amazon, 
as operations manager. Uh, and uh, now I'm working plus I'm an entrepreneur, but the most important thing I think for the newcomers when they are experienced, just observe the culture, the slangs. And as I said earlier, when you volunteer, you never know who is the CEO. You never know who is who. And it happens to me like I was volunteering. Uh, and when I go to Toyota Canada, so I, had, I was uh, Vancouver on that time when my interview came. And I drove because uh, they just take two suitcases of 23 kg. So I thought better to drive all the way from Vancouver to Ontario, like uh, Toronto. And it's a quite a bit drive, like four or five days. But I learned a lot. Uh, Cocohalla Mountain, Calgary, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. And Ontario is a big province, right? From you start up to end. So when I was entered in the board, they asked, uh, what's your passion about uh, Toyota? They didn't, they know that I, I'm an employee previously. I said that a person drove 5,000 kilometers. You are asking about the passion and that's it. They said, oh, why? and they're laughing. And so sometimes like you have to understood what's your passion, observe the things. Uh, uh, maybe you not understood slowly, but gradually you, you understand the culture and it's all about comfortability. Uh, no, uh, believe me, if you're talented, your talent never be waste. Might be you will little up and down, but if you believe on your skills, because the level I work before coming to Canada, I was here and inside the methodology, if, if a doctor, he have to pass the test uh, exam here in North America, he's already an MBBS doctor, he practiced. The only thing you have to go a little bit more to achieve this, this extra letter. And, and one of the thing I have experienced that all my previous experiences helps me, not only helps me, but guide the current team. And I said that I experienced in Singapore, that I experienced in Dubai, that I experienced in Malaysia, that I experienced when I was in Toyota England. And when I was in TMC, that is the Toyota motor, the TPS project of Kaizen. Even though very quickly after six months, I become a coach. We are the only seven people who is going around 200 dealership. So all your, it's only sometimes take time and then you catch up, but work hard, understand, uh, talk less, listen more and, uh, and understand the processes and, uh, and keep updating your education. I think that we never finish our education. Always I have this, there's a Japanese word called tamashi, not uh, tamashi like uh, Susie tamashi, but tamashi in Japanese means burning desire. You have to have that hungerness, uh, which like when I was in Toyota, I have to leave for a week and I have to wake up like 3 a.m. because I have to catch the flight for 6 a.m. It's a big change. And then whole week I'm driving from Saskatchewan to Manitoba to Calgary and taking flight from there. But all I was doing because I have that passion. So never, uh, and, and upgrading education, go to academies online, connect with the people. Like right now I'm with Connecting GTA, Ajax Pickering Board of Trade, Public Allies, RCP. And you never know who, who said, oh, you you done PNP, you done Six Sigma, why not you come? So this is a tough job. Uh, some people come in the middle of the age, some are the come as a student. For a student, it is easy journey because they gel quickly, because the biggest change for anyone who migrate is the change of the people. Sometimes it takes time. Then you are a bread feeder also. You have to make sure the earning coming in the same time you are. So it's not a easy and also make good understanding with your spouse. A lot of time what happened when you migrate, you go through with so much stress that your relationship impact. Because if your relationship is good with your spouse at home, it gives you energy. It gives you motivation. So don't lose your relationship at home. Uh, respect and understand and communicate better. And when you newcomer, talk to your spouse that, hey, you know, this is not easy. Sometimes you not have a license in early days. You are taking buses and trains and you are running for the... So the most important advice I give you not only run for the job, keep your relationship strong with your spouse because she also going through the same 
challenges, which a lot of time uh, our men forget that she is also my great. So res both respect is very important. And also not only you grow, tell your wife to learn the driving, to learn the education, go to the people, empower her. Because I think empowerment, and, and if you not do this, maybe you achieve your goal, maybe you achieve your job, but you lose your relationship. And that is very important what I saw during my long journey, uh, because I think uh, respect of a woman, empower as a woman is very important. Back to Aisha. Thank you, Azhar. That is an important point. Like, you know, having that work-life balance becomes important. Like, uh, you start working, uh, your spouse, uh, it is important that, you know, you have that good family connection and, you know, good vibes at home. So that's important. But, you know, um, uh, very important and very amazing points. But going into our next question, this is something that I believe. Um, when somebody is immigrating and when you see the papers, for example, if you've seen a doctor, isn't it important to make it clear to them that, you know, you might have worked as, you might have been a surgeon in your own country, but then when you come here, you need to take, you need to start uh, again, or, you know, you need to practice, you need to take a license, you need to, need to write exams, you need to start at the bottom and then uh, grow from there. So for me, it becomes important because now all of us are talking about it. It's understood. But when somebody comes here, they have a shock. They're like, what is this Canadian experience? I was not told about it while I was immigrating. And now it suddenly is on you. You're thinking like you're going to get your own um, cozy, cushiony job and you're going to be doing well. But you might have to end up working low at a lesser uh, uh, pay and you're not used to that. So that ends up into uh, uh, into mental issues, like, you know, you might go into depression, anxiety. There are so many things that can happen. So my next question is like, you know, skilled immigrants to Canada continue experiencing high rates of under, uh, underemployment or unemployment. So a lack of recognition of foreign credentials and experiences, language and communication barriers, discriminations, and employers' requirement of Canadian experience all contribute to this disconnect. What are your thoughts on it? What, what can be done with that? Susie, you go first. I've got the tough one, right? <laughs> yeah, you um, did. <laughs> well, for me, I think, um, we need to value the people that come to support us here and value that they do have the experience and the education. And I know Canada has the standards that they have to look at and be equivalent and, and have everything. I think they should better on that in trying to make more hands-on experience to see if this person knows what they're doing. If, they, if, if technology is a factor that they cannot um, execute their their career that they took in another country and cannot uh, apply it here what is an easier way that they can accomplish to to help us here to grow and have like more doctors in place because a lot of our doctors are leaving us and going to USA because they pay more um, so trying to keep the immigrants here that are educated with their previous experience in their previous education to make it equivalent here that they can apply it. So maybe having a hands-on volunteer for maybe for six months to see where they are at or testings applied at that time to see if they can manage to be a doctor in place or um, be a, like an engineer or like technology is always equivalent. So I think the major factor is the doctor part because a lot of our technology here in hospitals are done by robots and, and um, like uh, the technology itself. So I think that's where they should enhance more and allow more opportunities for new immigrants. Yeah, amazing point. Uh, and you know, um, uh, that is something uh, which can be used as a solution, like, you know, get them on the job and see where, uh, whether they can do the job or not, 
keep them on the job on a probation for maybe six months and then make them a permanent employee. If they don't do the job, if they're not up to it, then maybe you can suggest that, you know, you go back, study more or, you know, take up another job. So I agree with that, Susie. That's a wonderful uh, solution, actually. Azar, coming to you. Uh, thank you, Aisha. I think the very important thing, we have to change the legislation in the, in the government level. We have to start the programs. We have to, when you tell that person, like VPI solutions, right? And CDCD or ASD, what uh, Susie mentioned. I am now taking a lot of new employees who are in my company and then the VPI solution paying for them for their internship. Similarly, if I'm engineer or doctor or I'm an automotive employee and I came from a very big, all my life spent on project management or operations, uh, then uh, not some private companies basically uh, not just keep the person. You can go as a motivation for three, four, two, three months, but ultimately you have to run your, most of the immigrant coming, the biggest challenge, they have to, they, they are the breadwinner also. They bring a lot of money uh, and sometimes very less money, but they, the biggest challenge, they have to have their passion because they're a skilled worker. But in the same time, they have to run the home. And in the initial time with the kids and family is very challenging. So if government give us start those programs for doctors and engineers and project managers or even the, the chefs or even the plumbers, uh, and they said, we pay for them six months, please keep with them, shadowing them, that how they shadow each and all, everyone, and then give them the chance. I remember when I was in Toyota, Canada, even I my last position, uh, in uh, Middle East, Toyota was one of the, I was one of the leading uh, operations manager and director there. I started with the, as a consultant and I was shadowing and they are so nervous to send me to dealership that they thought I make some mistake because I representing Toyota Canada at that time. And they are so nervous. But when I start, my two dealership uh, in Calgary become one of the best. Even Japanese came and they evaluated my work on the dealership. And because of those work, uh, Toyota Canada get best of the best award from TMC, Toyota Motor Corporation. So I'm blessed that I was have a, this passion and I was continuously following. Plus some of the thing also, like when you're coming, make a proper file with the sleeves, with the, uh, the, with the folders. Don't depend on USB sometime, your USB corrupted sometime, something happened. Make a proper binder what your degrees are, what your experience letters are, what your credential, and make sure it cre credential process is started because sometimes it takes three to six months. Make sure you bring all your uh, projects. Uh, like, to be honest, I, I use still my lot of project work because I have all the backups while, while I'm bringing. But to be honest, what I am doing as a member of Newcomer Advisory Board in Dharam, and I'm raising this voice. And when you reach like to me after certain level, make whatever you had experienced, develop the program for others. What you challenge when you arrive, make something good for others who are still on the way of coming. Not just you achieve your goal, you are settled down, go, no. Think like I technically don't need to help others, but I don't want, I don't want that they go through with that experience, which I went through. And I was giving this suggestion on because ultimately some legislation have to make, some budget have to be approved, some programs have to be developed and multilingual. If you look if, even in Dharam, like India, Pakistan and Tamil are the leading communities here. The dynamics are changing. And now what happened in natives, we are learning that a lot of issues are coming back of uh, racism and, and it is very, very, so you never know, maybe he don't like you, maybe he's scared from your master's degree. You or a lot of things I have explained, they said you are overqualified because the person sitting there, he have high school and he reached to manager level by experience. And suddenly he saw someone sitting with him who is graduate and his master. So he's scared. He said, if that guy came, he take my job. So there is some board, there is a, some process who make, there is no discrimination. It should be on the merit basis. 
and there is some programs need to be start and once the immigration process start they have to ask those question which category and they give you some link when you landed rather in uh, ontario or manitoba saskatchewan or, or british columbia that these are the program and like service ontario they help and guide you why not you apply it so that program should be established budget should be allocated and then make sure the private companies who's hiring those talented skill worker they've been compensated because they are shadowing those talented staffs and another thing when i was going to on that on the cab i believe me i leaving early morning to the airport and some of the mbbs doctor crying they hate to drive cab but they have no other option because they failed three four time it's a very tough exam and later on they join some insurance company us base where they are giving the feedback because they have a uh, uh, medical background and we might be we drain lot of step this is one of the ways that what are such a talent not only ways but as a human is a human nature like if suzy is um, uh, have a passion about fashion and jewelry and i think i all when i always see her she, i she is smiling because at least she is doing what she she love about and she told me the story of her dad so similar passion dream and experience somebody brought from india somebody yeah. brought from malaysia so connect and this that is my feedback on that uh, platform amazing so uh, no that is actually true you know um, each one of us can contribute but at the same time if the government if the policies are better and if they can do something it it makes a lot of change parisa what's your take on it um yes um i actually did feel that there has to be a sort of a bridging program that connects new immigrants with the communities i mean there has to be a better way um when i landed here um though i did expect that there would be a certain bit of a struggle but what i didn't expect is the market is very close in a way that you have to know people for us to be able to especially if you if it's a um skills professional kind of a job so which is understandable yes people need to know you to know your skills but as a new immigrant how do you show that right um from my experience um i worked uh at with a company an oil and gas company which is very well known around the world um i graduated from a very good university in my country but suddenly here none of that none of that may had any more value but i did not expect that to happen in canada because i came here as a skilled immigrant it took me in because of my skills and so after coming here and then not getting that value for what i for my experience it was a bit of a shock yes um so the definitely has to be a better way of connecting with people with for example there are all of these co-op opportunities for graduate students why not something like that for new immigrants so they can also do a fixed term internship so that they can at least start building that network and understand how the work is here um so there is that part and basically i think one thing that um i'm sure a lot of us would go through is um this feeling with getting devaluated suddenly maybe back home you had a very high position and people really appreciated your achievements but suddenly here you are not that person anymore right because your experience or your achievements don't hold as much of a value so it can really get to you you know it can get depressing but um you have to deal deal with the cards that's dealt right so you just have to you know get, get like i mentioned before as well just make the best out of the situation that you are in so um one thing that you sh- i i have found helpful is try to eat from your now that the world is so much connected you can try to connect 
to people in companies in different your target companies through LinkedIn or through any other um, social uh, events. So that is a good way of connecting to people. You must know what your goal is, what you want to be, but at the same time, don't shy away from taking up other kind of work. Everything really helps. So um, there is that, and it's definitely a very difficult journey because I am still going through it. I still haven't reached to the part where I want to see myself in. But I'm, I would say that I'm still happy that I got the opportunities that I have gotten um, so far. And I'm hoping that if this will take me um, to, the, to the point where I want to reach. So, um, yes, uh, I do feel bad at times that um, my experience is not evaluated, uh, evaluated as much as I would like it to be, but, you know, you have to work on it. It is what it is. Uh, I wish there were better policies, and I wish there was a better way of connecting the immigrants to me. Um, so, but, yeah, oh, slowly, but surely it will happen. But it's just what I want to tell people is um, anybody who's looking to come to Canada and um, start doing something here that just, it's okay. I mean, just do what you can do. Do the best that you can do and just wait for it. You have to give it time and things will happen. Thank you so much, Parisa. That is amazing. You shared your own experience and your feelings, which is why I wanted you on this panel. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. Um, it also, uh, you know, what Azar said, what Suzy said, uh, everything so valuable for people who are going to come here. But, you know, Azar, to your point that, you know, about the credentials, having them in the folder, sometimes we invite so many refugees who don't have those credentials on them because they are lost or they're burnt and they're coming from countries which were which didn't move into the technology or didn't have it online or there so they cannot show the credentials so what what happens then for me it uh, i believe uh, bridging programs are very important like parisa said and uh, when you are starting as an immigrant, when you're told that, you know, your visa has been accepted or, you know, you have been accepted as a permanent resident, I think the government should start preparing people from that point. Like, you know, start their network, start their bridging programs while they are in their country. So when they come here, they have that uh, Canadian experience with them, right? So now it, I think it's going to become more easy because we all know how to work online, work from home. So wherever they are, it is going to work. But what are some other things that the, the government can do? What, according to you, can be the solutions, not by not talking about the immigrants, but what can the government do that can help in bridging these gaps? in overcoming these challenges. So Azar, you're going first this time. Uh, thank you, Aisha. I think it's a very valid point. Uh, regarding, before I come to this point, uh, what I said about a skill worker, but definitely who are refugees, especially I work for some Syrian families, mm -hmm. uh, some African family. Believe me, they not even have cloths. They not have, yeah. I was, uh, I'm very thankful some of the smiley community and some many charities and i'm also thankful to susie like uh, last few years she i was giving uh, we are coordinating for food thing and she was doing and definitely for those they don't need anything but i think some some group uh, like i was a part of the team who was picking them my duty was one week and then after bi-weekly for groceries to guide them how to put the gas where is grocery where is halal food basically, how find the halal food and what, like a lot of things they lost totally, right? It's a big, especially for refugees. And plus they have mental health issues because they come from the war zone area. And I think we have to not only help them on that level, they have to connect with the right people who is doing the 
physiotherapy, like uh, who are doing their sessions for bringing them out, like um, all the people who, and, and that anxiety is increasing. So there's a high demand. Regarding what government can do, I think the time I came, and right now is a day and night difference, is 360 degree change. Zoom sessions is there, Microsoft, Google, I think a lot of things. There's a will, there is a way, because a person who is coming from, uh, like I came from Dubai, luckily it was a very advanced place, but if somebody coming from back home, Pakistan and India and Bangladesh, there's a lot of gang. He is selling his house, he's hand over his things, He's like going to tailor to make the new suits, uh, you know, uh, and uh, they have a limited budget of two suitcase of 23 kg. Uh, they are sometimes cargo in advance to bring the thing. So I think government dedicated one window operation uh, on Zoom and virtual somebody and lot of back then the communication is like horrible. My, uh, we have to hire the lawyer to communicate, no reply. And suddenly reply come, you have now 60 days move on, or you have one month. And this happened to many people back then. Now you have no time uh, and no reply. So forget about fa facilitating. First thing, the communication at least email. I don't know what, uh, I think Wahhabi can tell more about it because back then communication was very wrong. So at least the communication should be very fast. Some facilitator from government window can communicate on Zoom uh, uh, with the all family. That family can now sit on a Zoom and they can facilitate them. Uh, that is very important because rather train them after bring them, at least set up their mind what you should bring, do and don'ts, uh, uh, how you, uh, you, you deal with. Don't bring, for example, mangoes because you cannot bring the vegetable and fruits here. This is property. Yeah. So a lot of things, you know, what I learn in my life, in happiness, always look small, small things which make you happy. Yeah. Don't wait for a big happiness. Similarly, in work, sometimes small, small things. Your weight, always when you put the baggage before you're leaving to Canada, it should be 21 kg because somehow when you reach on the counter, it becomes 23 kg and they ask you like, per kg, $100, maybe you don't have. Uh, yeah. So, and and uh, you should have six months of reserves till you go for service Ontario and have your license, bring your insurance because in my country, insurance is so bad, insurance letter. So you can give and get the credit and then make a checklist that, okay, done, done. So some person, if connect from immigration office and talk to that family for one hour, maybe that will help them a lot and they have a better experience and they have a better way to settle down. And I think it's, it's basically a charity. Like yeah. immigration is a, is, a, is a huge psychology and mental health stress, which everyone going through. So, uh, and, I, I, and I believe and I trust that our government can develop some type of this program, virtual link and, and, and train, like we are going for Hajj and pilgrim. So there is a session for one week that what you expect uh, when you reach there. So similar type of program. That is my suggestion. Thank you, uh, Azhar. Uh, and I believe the government does have such program, but uh, I don't know how many of them are accessing it. They do have one such program. I remember when I moved to Canada and um, they they asked us to join and I, I sat on a two-day program or a one-day program and they do have that but that is that is an excellent point Susie let's talk about what do you think they can do better um I agree with Azar um maybe having a mentor to assist them and guide them through there is a lot of videos that can be sent now that they can prepare for also like a mental assessment so that they are aware that there are going to be changes in climate and that they have to prepare that there's going to be snow so that they can have the clothing to wear so that they can prepare for that. Having a budget in place so that it allows them like that six months period for them to get access to assistance through the government um, and developing their skills like that is a major Thing that they should be focusing on to try to get them equivalent to what we are here doing 
and what is expected. Um, I know it sounds uh, tough, but it's a big change uh, from two different countries and everyone runs different things differently. So if yep. we can kind of train them before they get here and or, or just open their mind, not train them, open their mind to what to expect so that the, it's not a shocker for them. Absolutely, amazing. Yeah, amazing, Susie. Um, I think you just summed it, summed everything so well. I don't have to do it. <laughs> but you, sir, you go ahead. Thank you. So there, I think as Har and Susie both have mentioned that part really well. Uh, one thing that I want to mention is the education part. Um, so let's say somebody new here wants to get the credential to be recognized here. What about the education, right? It is so exorbitant expensive here that for a new immigrant who comes from, let's say, a little bit of a poor nation, or I would say the country that they were worked in, maybe they did not get paid as much because in Canada, suddenly the expenses have probably tripled or even quadrupled, right? The, the value of money has is quite different. So their savings which might have been a lot in their own country, might not be a lot here. So suddenly they're here. Now they need to get Canadian credentials because otherwise it would be difficult to find a job. So now what? Suddenly they have to, they realize they have to pay a lot to get another degree, let's say. So I think with here, here um, the government can maybe do some no, there are options for loans and all that, but then somebody has so many other financial responsibilities already, it is a difficult decision to make. So that maybe can be worked on. Maybe some of the maybe the government can work with certain universities and maybe arrange for certain certification programs that can be offered to newcomers at a lower cost so that at least they can get that certification to be able to get into the work. So um, I think that part is really important. The other thing I would say, if this is from my experience, which was kind of, I was a little bit taken aback with that. So um, I had applied for my professional engineer certification here, but even though I have seven years of engineering experience, I can't know that I would be given engineering training just because I don't have one year of Canadian experience, which was a little bit shocking for me because engineering principles do not change based on the country, right? So I think there are these little gaps that the government can fill in and say that, okay, um, this experience can be evaluated properly so that um, let's say if I get a professional engineer certification, the kind of job I can apply to greatly changes if I am uh, from, if my designation is an engineer uh, in training, right? So I think these are little things that at least the government can look into and change the policies so that it can help the newcomers. A bit. So that's, that's just another side that I wanted to point out um, along with what Azhar and Susie have said. Amazing. Like, you know, you guys provided exactly um, what is needed. I hope somebody is listening and uh, they take these suggestions. One of the best points that I like is providing that point of contact or mentor, like you guys said, uh, which becomes important from the start. As soon as you get that acceptance, you are allotted a person who will be your point of contact, who can help you in all these things. Like, you know, when you talk about luggage, how much you can bring, what you can bring, what you don't have to bring, then what are the skills that you need to upgrade? What, what are the programs that you can take? What language skills, if you're not up to it, how you can better them? Then again, how the credentials are matched here, in fact, you know, I think what they can do is if it is a doctor, match a doctor to that person. And there are so many people who want to readily volunteer for this. If you're an engineer, you have somebody from the engineering background who can help you with that. So I think it, 
hand holding like you know you have the big brothers big sisters mentorship programs here in canada you can extend the same for the new immigrants or refugees who are there providing them with people who can speak their language who can understand them who are coming from their own culture don't you think that would be like so amazing that is one of the suggestion aisha i given to new comer advisory table Mm -hmm. that not only he must be engineer or doctor he should be same caste and same country and same language because sometime even i give one slang and one line in hindi or in urdu or maybe wahabi in bangla it resolve like this because it's the mother tongue it's the mother language and we are tons of people here who's multilingual and i think yeah. this is very important not only profession wise but the caste wise and country wise what you convey um, mm -hmm. i think it's because you know both cultures basically yeah that's amazing anybody wants to add anything um i love the idea of what you mentioned to maybe have them mentored for a year before they come so that they can use that as their work experience that they've related to someone here or they've improved their skills so that it can be equivalent to what is in our workforce today so that they can apply themselves and say yes i have a one year experience it was online but i i followed through and here i am today to to follow through of visually or or on on site right so yeah, yeah. i i like that and, and also like you know that, yeah that, go ahead that yeah basically that will also help canada to yeah. bring the the time they came and waste here if they have the mentor or uh, right guidelines or right support uh, mentor or one window operation they become more uh, uh, comfortably settled down way more quicker and government no need to give them grants for settle down just help them to get uh, to put on their feet rather than don't give them the fish teach them how to catch the fish and and it's a benefit for our country uh, canada that we have better skill they become more happy because they are doing what they have a passion to do and what experience they are bringing with that i i completely agree uh, azar it's like a reduced stress on the social services because they as soon as they come they will become the tax paying immigrants and that adds to the economy of uh, canada and it could it could result in, it obviously is going to result in the growth of the economy as a whole right parisa do you have anything to add No yes I agree to the mentorship um mm -hmm. mentioned um in fact after coming here I have had a couple mentors as well which really did help me a lot um not just in terms of introducing me of how to navigate the job sector here but also they helped me in networking with other professionals of uh, of my background right so that has been quite helpful And of course some of the things that i didn't know for example i didn't realize that um probably my experience because i had actually an assumption that because i worked internationally maybe my experience would have a high value yeah but it didn't so i wish i had known that before these are the things so i could have worked on certain things from beforehand before coming here so that would be that would certainly be quite quite helpful and yeah. the reason that i mentioned about education is when after coming here now you have to think of paying the bills then working and then how do you also pay for an uh, another degree let's say yeah so there was an easier way um so i'm sure um there are organizations actually who work with newcomers yes but that's still not enough i think the scope should be broader um mm -hmm. it's not just about um getting them ready for interviews but actually getting them ready for the job itself as well and how to do that by themselves getting them ready or giving them the amenities needed giving them the um the scope so that they can work on it by themselves so i'm sure for especially for high skilled professionals who have a 
such experience from outside, they don't really need the hand holding just as much, but just give them that opportunity, which I think through a bridging program can really help them. Yeah. So what I think is um, not applying the same formula for everybody, right? So there are different people and so that there are different things to cater to different people. Not everybody requires the same kind of guidance. What at same level, I would say, some people might need a little bit more guidance, right? And some people maybe just a little bit. So, yeah, it's a time-taking process, but I hope that that comes into place and that would definitely help out. No, that's absolutely uh, right, uh, Parisa, because, you know, there are so many organizations that I know, like, you know, Suzy works with shelters and Azar works with nonprofits and you work as volunteer with so many organizations. So you know that there are programs uh, to improve their language skill. There are programs which help them know about the civic, uh, you know, engagement, leadership. There are programs which help with your mental health which help with, with uh, knowing the culture itself. So why not provide all these programs even before they enter into the country so they are prepped and prepared once they enter, even as much as resume writing, looking for jobs. Yes. If you can teach them that, if you can prepare their resumes while they are in their country, and when they come here, they're prepared to go and just do the interviews rather than going around these organizations in building their skills, right? And, and, re and recently we on Public uh, Allies uh, platform do the youth leadership program and Aisha knows how many calls I'm receiving that we, we can't afford this, uh, yeah. this piece. So God and I am already inform our um, uh, right people to, to give us grant for this youth leadership program which Public Allies uh, started. And, and, and that is very important that grant go to the right location. And I, I'm very appreciate Aisha that she, she started that program. I very highly, you know, the respect is increased when I look Susie other than fashion designing, when she's working with the shelter woman, taking the milk uh, because I cannot go to shelter due to reasons, but she came from her work with her car, with his son, collect all this and go like this is amazing spirit we have amazing people right. round the table even in public allies or you know we just have to make a group of right people and serve better basically yeah no i agree with that there are people who are ready to help it is just that you need to ask them what they what needs to be done there are so many volunteers by the way we are at the end of the time and I'm so sorry, guys, we can keep going on. We can give suggestions after suggestions to the government to improve. But um, we have to stop now. <laughs> thank so, you thank so much for having us. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, Aisha. Yeah, but then to end it all, the scope of services has been restricted over years, which means that Canadian government programs are weakest in dealing with the area of greatest need. The second stage of settlement involving labor market integration and equitable access to general health, housing, and social services. The conventional social policies have not met complex contemporary needs such as immigrant settlement because economic inequalities are entrenched in social problems and responsibilities for their solutions cut across multiple sectors. Short-sighted social support policies are at odds with their resolution, with, with the operational needs of service organizations, the continuum of social support needs in immigrant communities, and the complex protracted nature of immigrant settlement. The immigrant adaptation process warrants a long-term holistic perspective to improve supportive policies and programs. And that is what Canada needs. And that is what we ask uh, the governments to do. But we also talk, we tell the immigrants to just have that will and passion and go for it because it is going to happen for you. So thank you so much, everyone, Parisa, Azar, Susie, for being here with us and discussing what you went through or what you've seen around you. So we enjoyed it thoroughly. And hopefully, maybe we need to do another one 
because it's never enough. One hour is never enough. We will see you again. Uh, and from Public Allies, it is um, bye for now. But next week, we are coming with Trish Wetstone, who is going to be talking about good gut health on 29 July. See you then. Take care and have a good evening. Bye. Bye.